So as I said, I'm really pleased uh, Roy's able to join us he this evening. It's great to have such a major figure from British politics to deliver the annual politics lecture. So please uh, join me in welcoming Roy. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> I can't resist beginning by saying that uh, sometimes I feel I'm out of my time, that uh, I'm 20 years out of politics and 20 years out of technology, uh, demonstrated by the fact that here we are, surrounded by these wonderful applications, and I'm working off a broken down cardboard box. <laughs> um, but there we are, we'll make the best of it, and uh, make the best of uh, the cardboard box. Uh, I begin, as you might expect a superannuated politician to begin, with an anecdote. Uh, ten years ago, when I was a Guardian Weekly columnist, the Observer asked me to write a profile of the Prime Minister. I knew Tony Blair very well. He'd worked for me when I was Shadow Chancellor, but I humbly observed the rules and applied to number 10 for an interview. Nothing happened for weeks. Then one Monday morning, my Guardian column ended, the problem with Tony Blair is he wants to take politics out of politics. About 20 minutes after I've read that for myself, the telephone rang and I was invited to number 10 down the street that afternoon at 3 o'clock. <laughs> um, I was having lunch that day with an old friend, Professor Maurice Peston, now Lord Peston, had been my special advisor when I was in the Cabinet, and he urged me not to go. He said, uh, a combination of good manners and Tony Ben's Tony Burr's charm will encourage me to capitulate. He said... Uh, You'll hang around for about 20 minutes, then you'll be invited into the cabinet room. Blair will come out in his shirt sleeves, probably carrying a cup of tea. He'll welcome you heartily. He'll say, what's all this about taking politics out of politics? And you'll collapse like a heap of cards. Well, I was confident that my moral fibre would survive Blair's combination of charm and confidence. So I kept the engagement. I hung about for about 20 minutes. <laughs> um, I was then invited into the cabinet room. Tony Blair came out in his shirt sleeves carrying a cup of tea <laughs> and said to me, what's all this about taking politics out of politics? <laughs> we'll never know whether my courage would have withstood the assault. For before I could say anything, he answered his own question. You don't get it, he said, one of his favourite catchphrases of the time. You don't get it. The people out there want a government that works, not all this ideological stuff. As he did so, he waved towards the window of the people out there which unfortunately were a troop of household cavalry going past, but we didn't really point that out. I didn't point that out to him, nor did I tell him that people who say they have no ideology have an ideology in itself. Nor did I quote, I quote to you, the famous aphorism by John Maynard Keynes, practical men who believe themselves to be exempt from theoretical influences are usually slaves to some defunct economist. I take it for granted that you don't need to be convinced of either of the precepts. So what I'm going to do with your agreement is perform an autopsy on Tony Blair's statement. What the people want is good government. That statement encompasses two implications and a related assertion. The first implication is that in a democracy, the politician's duty is to do what the people want. The second implication is that there exists or can be created something that can be objectively described as a government that simultaneously benefits all classes and all social groups. The assertion in the in the Blair statement, is that conviction politicians, that's men and women whose politics are based on a coherent view of society, stand in the way of government creation. And I propose to examine all those contentions one by one. You see that, you see that modern technology and I don't get on. <laughs> I don't think... I, you know, as an old-fashioned politician, I ought, to be able to make, I ought to be able to make you hear anyway. Can you hear anyway? If you want to hear, can you hear? Right. <coughs> well, let's return to the subject. It's remarkable that the next sentence happens to be, although no longer in fashion. Um, I remain firmly committed to the principle set out by Edmund Burke, is addressed to the elector of Bristol on November 3rd, 1774. Let me read it to you. Your representative owes you not only his industry, but also his judgment. And he betrays, instead of serving you, if he sacrifices his judgment to your opinion. Now, of course, parliamentary politics have moved on since Burke's day. 
the collection of individuals who in the 18th century came together in a loose alliance to form administrations has been replaced by party government. And that is, as I shall argue, both necessary and desirable. But the principle remains the same. The party leadership deciding policy, backbench MPs and candidates attempting to influence it, should first and foremost do what they believe to be right, do what they believe to be best to the country, believe what they do, to be, do what they believe to be necessary. Of course, there will have to be a judgment, uh, and there will have to be a judgment demanded from both by the collective responsibility of party government and the holy lord of political desire to win elections in order to replace talk with action. Believe me, I don't share the view expressed by that London council leader who sent his supporters out one Sunday morning in camera saying with the slogan, remember, no compromise with the electorate. Uh, I understand the need to make adjustments to win elections. But over the recent past, <coughs> what people want, the slogan, what people want, been elevated into a matter of principle and politicians who stand against it are said to be disregarding the national will and being anti-democracy. The fact is that the politicians who ignore what is supposed to be the national will are usually regarded as arrogant. But arrogance goes with conviction. And better accept the arrogance than lose the conviction. The politicians who know what they want are the sort of politicians you want, the sort of politicians you need, the sort of politics to do the best country. Conviction politicians seem to me to be the only politicians worth voting for. What sort of man or woman wants to become a member of parliament in order to act as a cipher and a surrogate? What sort of man or woman wants to express other people's opinions and vote like a human calculating machine by responding to the weight of numbers? Populism, responding to national prejudices, used to be regarded as an occasional necessity. It has been now elevated into a political virtue. Instead of politicians evangelizing, going out in the country and attempting to make the converts in their cause, they increasingly sit behind their word process and wait to be converted themselves by the latest opinion polls, the latest opinion polls and focus groups. And they justify that policy that without principle by saying they're doing what the people want. Agreeing to whatever the people want may have helped to individual politicians or parties to win specific elections, not an important achievement. But it has done immense damage to the standing of politics and politicians in general. Nothing not the expenses scandal, not MPs for hire, not the sheer incompetence of government has so devalued the trade which I followed for 50 years than the accusation that they don't believe in anything. That allegation is unfair and untrue. But increasingly, politicians believe in this. They believe in what Harold Wilson called pragmatism, once described as flying by the seat of his pants, doing his best in the national interest, responding to the neighbour of the times, bending to circumstances. Nobody was ever inspired by pragmatism. And governments which regard it as their guiding principle always lose their way. They also neglect their obligations to those sections of the community whose welfare depends on the courage and the commitment, the convictions and the beliefs of men and women who decide on the economic and social prospects of the least well-off groups. Right now we face a possible catastrophe, the consequences of accepting a national mood, or with a combination of principle and prejudice, information and ignorance. Accepting it without argument. The catastrophe which I refer is the prospect of lo losing the common market, leaving the common market because it is generally believed to be the will of the people. There is not a senior politician of any note, an industrialist of any influence, or a trade unionist of any importance who does not believe that it would be a disaster to leave the common market, the European Union. Yet we are in danger of floating out almost in a fit of absent-mindedness because it is said to be the will of the people. We are said to be in danger of floating out because to do anything else would be democracy. But it would not be a denial of democracy, it would be a denial of good government. The people to be blamed are not those who refuse to accept the national will. It's those people who do what they know to be wrong because it seems to be the easy way of going through their political lives. Now, I don't believe for a moment that many of the so-called populist politicians are populist in the real sense of the word. If you take Mr Nigel Farage, he believes absolutely that we must respond to the national will as far as the European Union is concerned. But ask him if we must respond to the national will as far as smoking in public places is concerned, and he dismisses the idea as ridiculous. Uh, very often, very often, um, the excuse that we're doing what the people want is an excuse for supporting what you want yourself. But nevertheless, I think there's a the case for arguing that what the people want has to be regarded with very great care and very great caution. And sometimes it's a reality. Uh, a reality which I remember feeling very strongly in 1996, when together with the first vice, ch vice chancellor of this university and the uh, last principal of the Polytechnic, Christopher Price, Christopher Price and I, and a man called Brian Walden, who we've now forgotten, 
all sat down in a scruffy little Italian restaurant and decided on how we should proceed in what was called the Rivers of Blood election. The Rivers of Blood election was reaction to Enoch Powell's discovery that the main detriment to British prosperity was Commonwealth immigration. Um, we now talk about the Rivers of Blood speech, though that was by far the least vile part of the declaration. I remember being in the schoolyard in Birmingham when I read about it in a newspaper and read the phrase, little pop-eyed pickaninnies pushing dog faces through door boxes. I was surrounded by young blacks. It gave me a very strong view about how I should react to Mr Enoch Powell in private and future future. But we, Christopher Price, Brian Walden and I, sat down in this scruffy little Italian restaurant and thought, how do we deal with this election? The election in which almost everybody we meet says Commonwealth immigration is a disaster and it should be replaced by repatriation forcibly if necessary. We decided we'd take our chances. We were not going to support it under any court, any conditions. And that seemed to me to be the right thing to do under the circumstances. The right thing to do under any circumstances, a great moral proposition. Now, having given that little example of how virtuous I've been, let me admit that uh, ideology comes in various shapes and sizes. Many Tory politicians are, ideologues, are ideologues without knowing it. Some Conservatives, who've never read a word of Adam Smith in their lives, believe in his prescription for economic support, not as a theory, but they just think it's common sense. Others take it as self-evident that the least government is the best government. Now, democracy, in my view, would be best served by the Tories openly accepting and defending the political principles on which their policies are based, and the Labour Party doing the same. That offers a government, offers a choice of government, a real democratic choice between the people. But an obstacle stands in the way of that happy outcome, which I freely admit with some regret. The Labour Party has never been quite sure what its ideological base is. Paradoxically, although Labour has always argued that the needs of the time are too obvious to justify wasting time on the theoretical justification, it is constantly criticised for basing its policies on ideological commitment. Although we are not the ideological party, we are always accused of being it by the Daily Mail, the Daily Express and the Telegraph. You know the phrases, the politics of envy, class warfare, one size fits all, and similar related meaningless cliches. Many of the mistakes of the Blair years, about which I shall go on at length in a moment, were made because of government's passion to lose that reputation. And Labour paid a very high price from sharing away from what Tony Crossman called hanging its policies inside an ethical framework. Now, there was a time when the Labour Party could do without a formal philosophy to live by. The programme on which it was elected in 1945, the creation of a health service, the organisation of benefit system and full employment, that was built on necessity. But because it met the needs of one class, the working class, it had an ideological basis automatically built in without thinking about it. Labour could afford to be what GDH Cole called the party of the underdog. Now the underdog is still with us and is in urgent need of a party which supports its interests. But the underdog is no longer sufficiently numerous to elect a government of its choice and Labour now, has to argue its, uh, Labour now has to argue its ideological case, the case for its existence. Unless we ex give a reason for existing, nobody will take us for granted. They're gone asking the question which is so damning to all political parties. But what are they for? In 1950, R.H. Crossman said that the Labour Party lost its way, not because it had no maps of the country it was going to traverse, but because it thought maps were unnecessary for experienced travellers. That, I think, is still the position. It may even be the position today. It was certainly the position of Newton Labour. And we now know the consequences of plucking theoretical consensus politics out of the illogically thin air. A modern consensus can only be built around middle class voters, middle class values and middle class prejudices. A modern social democratic party can only succeed, perhaps only survive, if it challenges some of the prejudices and argues on the basis of a coherent ideology for radical change in the nature of society. That is why I voted for Ed Miliband as leader of the Labour Party. That's why I look forward to him winning the next general election. Now I must say in defence of consensus-minded politicians, that they have to overcome a temptation to, pol to populism which uh, other generations didn't have to face. One of my many political heroes, Mr William Ewart Gladstone, actually believed that people supported his view that General Gordon should be left to his fate at Khartoum and it would be a waste of British resource and British lives to send an expeditionary, source, uh, expeditionary force to rescue this ridiculous old fanatic from the Mahdi and his followers. 
he actually believed that he would win the election by saying, leave, leave Gordon where he was. Now, if the Moripol had existed in 1885, Sir Robert Worcester would have been along in Downing Street in five minutes to say to Mr. Gladstone, get Gordon out of Khartoum or you are doomed as he is doomed. One of the problems of modern day politics is it's too easy to know how to win elections. It's too easy to know what to do to get. And if you doubt it, read tomorrow's account of the budget. Uh, I know from my own experience in government and as opposition that last night and the night before, weeks ago, Mr. Osborne would have been receiving advice about what the people wanted. And he was, the temptation, therefore, to do what they want wrong that he thinks right is almost overwhelming because you know this is what we do to win. Notwithstanding that, I still believe that the politics has to be based on principle. And I give you an example which you might like to comment when we get round to questions. It's a hypothetical example, wholly hypothetical, an example from present day politics. Let us assume there's a politician, even a retired politician, who without his career supported the idea of nuclear deterrence, believed that he kept Europe at peace for 70 years and thought that the campaign for nuclear disarmament was profoundly muddle-headed. Let us firm, further assume, purely hypothetical, this politician, this retired politician, now believes that the renewal of the nuclear submarine programme is a scandalous waste of money since the present threat to Britain has nothing to do with and cannot be prevented from taking place by the programme of mutual destruction. Yet he knows that more than three quarters of the British public, including Scotland, more than three quarters of the British public want Britain to possess its own nuclear weapon. They want, in the words of Mr Ernest Bevin, if there's an atomic bomb, there ought to be a union jack on it. In election year, does the politician argue the case he knows to be right, or does he say, keep quiet until the election's over because we want to win? It's a dilemma which you might help me to solve, since that hypothetical politician may not be quite as hypothetical as I try to make out. <laughs> now, you see, when I insist that politicians should be principally guided by their own genuine convictions, I am not, emphatically not, arguing in favour of constant rebellion. The constant rebel is more often motivated by vanity and self-promotion than high principle. Yet the politics of belief and conviction have become confused with MPs' increased willingness to defy party whips. Defying party whips should be occasional necessity. I did it during the vote on the common market, and now nearly 20 years ago, when I was one of the 87 who rebelled against the opposition and voted with the Tory government. But it was once in a lifetime. During this parliament, rebellions have been more frequent than at any time since 45 but they have not always been the product of conviction politics and independence of mind. Sometimes they've been the result of exhibitionism or self-indulgence, sometimes of pressure from vested interest, but almost always they ignore the importance of body politics, which is a vehicle through which individual judgment and convictions are expressed. That leads me to the second implication of what I'll call the Blair Remonstrance. The notion that there is or can be an intrinsically good government which meets universal needs. Tony was always accused of being a politician without principles. I've no doubt that he was a politician of high principle, which I experienced when he was working for me. The problem was not that he had no principles, he had the wrong principles. And one of his principles was that there was a paradigm person, a man who loved his wife, looked after his children, never kicked his dog, washed his car every Sunday morning, made sure that children went to Sunday school, and above all, dug his front garden. And politics was for that man. Now, all of us have a vision of the person we're working for in politics. I have to confess, it was not that man that Tony was working for. I felt I went into politics because I wanted a more equal society on behalf of the underpaid and the undervalued. And that seemed to me to be the great omission in present day politics. Of course, there can be efficient government or less incompetent government that we've endured during the recent past. But it's not the same as a good government to which Tony Blair inspired. He meant government with no sensible decent persons could disagree. Government of the middle ground, the third way of the consensus. Now, I profoundly believe that the whole of society, rich and poor, will be benefiting in the long term from living in a more equal society. But until the happy state is achieved, the idea of good government has to be qualified with the question, good for whom? John Rawls tells us that in a democracy, rights collide, that it's a government's duty to decide in between them, to adjudicate between them. Pretending that the, to, to duck the choice usually results in decisions which benefit the articulate, the self-confident and the well-to-do. The party system is, or ought to be, the manifestation of different views of a good society. When class distinction is more visible than today, you'll notice that I say more visible, say more visible but not more pronounced, 
The parties openly represented class interests. Now they offer chances once every five years for the electorate to make a strategic choice between rival ideas as well as rival policies. And they can't make that choice legitimately unless the parties set out what their basic ideas are. Now, that implies that the electorate are going to vote according to the manifesto. I don't make much on the doctrine of the manifesto. Not, not so much because I wrote, helped to write five, but because I helped to break three. But th 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 I have been the party to breaking three or four, three, because that became necessity. But in a sense, the manifesto is even more important when the government changes its mind. Because the government, there's an in, there's a inherent, secret, private, secondary manifesto, which is not the ag individual specifications of what policy will be, but the feeling of whose side the government is on. There's a silent manifesto that says they'll do this in an emergency, a situation which we can't predict, they're more likely to act in our interest than the others are. And I believe it's the manifesto is essential to setting out the democratic choice, and then without it, there can be no real political decisions. But that doesn't mean that we can raise too much importance on it. It means that we have to take it as it comes and realise the limitation in all these things. Now, I was a member of the last Labour government which consciously struggled to represent the notions which social democracy is associated. Then as now, I regard public ownership and provision as only appropriate to a limited area of the economy, the public utilities, and emphatically the health service and social care, and the administration of justice. I believed, in the words of Professor Arthur Lewis, that socialism was about equality. The pursuit of equality is what took me into politics and kept me there for 50 years. That's why I was delighted to learn that when I entered the cabinet, the same Maurice Peston who persuaded me not to see Tony Blair was my senior political advisor. And the day before I arrived in my new department, the permanent secretary met him, rather overawed by the idea of having a full professor from the University of London as his political advisor, said, tell me, Professor Peston, how do you see your role? And Professor Peston replied, to provide intellectual justification for the Secretary of State's political prejudices. And that's it. <laughs> I was proud of my political prejudices because it determined, it determined what side I was on. Preston was in his flippant way illustrating the error of Tony Blair's contention. There is not never can be, until society changes, a universally beneficent government. The pretense that it is possible always to pursue the politics which are good for everybody always ends with the rich and powerful coming off best. Take what is called the choice agenda. Freedom for every patient to be treated in hospital, in a hospital of his or her choice. That was supposed to be universally beneficial. It worked wonderfully well for family with sharp elbows, but it doesn't work very well for anybody else. I became very conscious of this myself when I was in the hospital what, two years ago, I've got things called stents in my, one of my veins to keep the blood flowing. Believe it or not, it is. Um, and one day I got a letter which said, uh, it's now two years since your stents are fitted. You should be in time for your annual re examination. So as I lay on the couch being ex annually examined, I said to the doctor, you've sent a rather stupid letter. Uh, I, mean, I amused myself with what was going on two years for a yearly examination. He took this very seriously and said, but you know, you should know of all the people. The way you get what you want in the health service is agitating. You should, get, you should have been on the phone in for a year. The way you get what you want out of the health service is by making a point of demanding it. Now that's fine for some people. It's fine for the articulate, it's fine for the self-confident, it's fine for the educated, it's fine for the prosperous. But it isn't fine for the people I've represented in Birmingham for 33 years. The choice agenda is an exact example of why pretending we can help all the people all the time simultaneously, it only helps a few of them. Now, I want to spend some moments having gabbled through that in order that I can do it, describing to you what I believe the philosophy of the Labour Party should be. It's based on three reputable philosophers, or two and a half reputable philosophers. Uh, the first is wholly reputable, T.H. Green, who began to un us understand the nature of freedom. His seminal work is a work on Gladstone's second Irish land bill, which goes like this. The Irish land bill said, the Irish landlord and the Irish tenant farmer are not mutually free because they're allowed to do whatever they want by negotiating contracts. By having no restraint on either the landowner or the tenant farmer, we're not giving a genuine freedom, we're having a situation in which one party, being so much stronger than the other, dominates the other. The landlord can rack rent, he can put up the rent every year until the man has to go bankrupt and leave, virtually giving back the land to his owner. He can increase the price of his commodity. He can exact extra rent for improvements that the landowner has not made himself, but has been made by the tenant farmer. Gladstone's second land bill 
prescribed rules which governed the relationship between landlords and tenants in Ireland and was denounced as a denial of freedom because it was government interfering with what two free parties could do without government intervention. And Gladstone said, and T.H. Reid expanded, that is not freedom. And we are saying here that freedom is not the freedom to avoid restraint, but the freedom to do those things which we want to do. It's what's called in philosophy the concept of agency, the ability to do things. Not freedom from, but freedom to. And Labour Party policy, social democracy, social policy, have to begin with understanding that freedom is not saying do what you like. It's saying sometimes there has to be a degree of restraint to protect the weak against the poor. That's where the half philosopher comes in, R.H. Tawney. Uh, R.H. Tawney is the most attractive of all philosophers because of the way in which he writes. Uh, he writes about, you probably know, the situation of the frog in the pool who gets onto a lily leaf and croaks to the tadpoles that anybody as industrious as he can lose their fins and become a frog one day. When he knows perfectly well that only one tadpole in a thousand becomes a frog. But he keeps the tadpoles happy and keeps them at peace because the frog is telling them it's their fault if they don't evolve into a superior sort of animal. But on this subject, Tony said, freedom for the carp is death to the minnow. And that is a basic principle of Labour Party social democratic policy, that the rich have to be restrained, the powerful have to be restrained in harm behalf of the weak and the vulnerable. That's point one. Point two is where that relates to e equality. Uh, Mrs Thatcher, as you the introduction said, always insisted that her view of freedom was inimical to a more equal society. But Tawney tells us, and Rawls, John Rawls has told us since, what well, seemed to be a basic truth, that the more equality there is, the greater freedom there is for the majority of people. Let me give you an example. There was a very famous uh, industrialist, I won't name him because he wanted to sue me for doing so, um, who went to prison for fraud. And uh, as he was going into prison, I mean, went, went home to get his gear, he was interviewed by a young lady from independent television, who, like young ladies from independent television, asked the obvious question, are you a millionaire? And he said, yes, I am a millionaire. And then she said, is it good? Do you like being a millionaire? And he said, well, it's jolly good being a millionaire because I do what I want. Uh, if I want to work, I work. If I want to go on holiday, I get my aeroplane and I fly. And, I can decide, and I'm deciding now whether to leave my money to my children or leave some of it to um, charities. You see, he said, being a millionaire makes me free. And whether he knew it or not, he was explaining the doctrine of agency, that freedom is being able to do things. And if we took some of that millionaire's money and spread it about amongst, say, 150 old age pensioners, they wouldn't be able to go on holiday to Spain or leave a bequest to their daughters or fly to the Hebrides but they'd be able to wear a warm winter coat. They'd be able to pay fuel bills. They'd be able to travel to see their children in distant places. The money would make them free. The more we, the more we distribute funds, the more, free, more the sum of freedom grows. And that, finally, is explained by John Rawls. Well, John Rawls, who answers the crucial questions. First of all, the one I described earlier on, government's duty to distinguish between rival claims but secondly, how much equality society can tolerate and can demand. It's called the Gavisham Difference Principle. And he says that you should go on expanding equality until the people who benefit from equality say no more. People who benefit from equality, you say you've done enough. And uh, there's examples of when that's happened. In the Soviet Union, between the wars, uh, some Soviets decided that they were not going to have a situation in which some people had 20 pairs of shoes and other people had only one pair of shoes. So the Soviets had a common shoe-making policy. The only difficulty is all the shoes let in water and none of the shoes fitted. So the people who only once had one pair of shoes said, we'd rather go back to that than have the greater equality you provided. Well, that's a very extreme example. Um, but it's there to explain to us that we've got to expand the equality until the people who benefit from it say, hold on, we've had enough. And we now know for certain, do we not, that, that is a system which, when it comes about, benefits the whole of society, not just the poor. If you read the books which have come out in the last 10 years, um, describing the consequences of inequality, that in the Western societies, the greater the inequality, the greater the social diseases, 
the greater the drug taking, the greater the teenage unwanted ch pregnancies, the, the greater street crime, the greater rural violence. All those things that happen least in more equal societies are most in the unequal societies. And that's why the Labour Party ought to be proud to argue this case, saying it's rational as well as right. And I should go on and argue it, uh, even when I uh, become finally convinced that the Labour Party has taken it over and needs to argue no more. What the point is, and the basic point I'm making, is that politicians have to decide whose side they're on. For instance, they have to choose between the interests of homeowners who become liable to mansion tax and the benefit of the, those who benefit, the advantage of those who benefit from the social services which could be improved by spending the income of mansion tax on other things. I have no doubt at all that to do so is a way to victory. And I sometimes almost despair that the Labour Party doesn't realise that its interests, its own best interests, are to be solved by making clear what it is we stand for. I hope you'll forgive me for taking examples from my own experience, but it ought to be able to say that in government we have a practical view of equality and a practical view of bringing it about. And we may, may, we may only be able to do it through small things but the small things sometimes count. I'll give you an example of a very small thing that happened during my time in the Cabinet. During the IMF crisis, the Crosslandites, uh, there were four of us at the beginning, Shirley Williams, David Ennals, Bill Rogers and me. Uh, at the end, there were two of us, uh, Tony Crossland and me. Uh, and we capitulated because we realised that whether the case we had to make for economic success was true or false, international opinion was against us and the lack of confidence meant that we had to go along with the Chancellor. But when we'd lost a basic battle over the IMF cuts, we tried to look at small things, how we could sort of mitigate their worst effects on the most vulnerable people. And I discovered that in my department we were subsidising butter. We were spending about £5 million a year, which was a lot of money in those days, £5 million subsidising butter. We've been subsidising it since the war. And when I asked why we're subsidising butter, I've given two answers. The first is that the New Zealanders have been very loyal and supportive during the war. Um, the Minister of Agriculture, Mr Fred Peart, said he'd commanded an artillery battery at Alamein, and the next battery to him was a New Zealand battery, and he wasn't going to see butter subsidy removed. Um, he didn't note, but I pointed out to him, that the New Zealand farmers had a standard of living about twice as high as English farmers and English, English people. The second reason was that to cut the butter subsidy would be to offend an absolutely crucial class of people, the upper middle classes. And when asked why that was, I was shown a graph which demonstrated that if you're very poor, you use hardly any butter at all. If you're quite well off, you lose a good deal of butter for toast and sandwiches. If you're very rich, you use it for cooking. In fact, the richer you are, the more butter you use. In fact, the richer you were, the more butter subsidy you got. And this struck me as being preposterous. Um, and we fought it out in the cabinet. And uh, in the end, it was agreed that I could give up my butter subsidy as long as it went on something which I regarded as worthwhile. And we used it for Shirley Williams reducing the cost of school meals. Now that's a small thing, it's a terribly small thing, but it is possible, when people say this idea of greater equality is all airy fairy nonsense, you can't do it, it is possible that it can be done. And what we want is people with the intention of doing it, if they have the intention, the practice can come about as well. So let me sum up. So some of the advantages of ideological politics. First and foremost, they give politicians a purpose. They give them things to live by. They establish a coherence and a consistency of a political party programme, which therefore gives voters a clear picture of what to expect from its government. Every, even a government which is true to its manifesto in every detail comes up against unexpected events. But a clear statement of principle at least gives them a rough idea of what they're likely to do in unforeseen circumstances. Secondly, a clear ideological policy of the use of the criticism that a party plucks policies out of the air or whim to hope of political advantage. I don't want lectures from Ed Miliband and his colleagues on the subjects I've described. I don't want him to give a speech on John Rawls' difference principle or T.H. Green's theory of political, political freedom. But I would just like him and his colleagues to make clear in normal political language, in normal everyday language, 
that where we are in government, we will do the best for the people who need most, and if necessary, that means penalising people who need the least. I do that because of my own political ideology. But I also do it because I know, in a sense, it's very popular. Knowing what the government wants, knowing what they want to do, having a firm principle, having set ideas, having a determination, makes politicians possible. Mrs Thatcher was popular amongst people who didn't agree with a word she said because they said, at least you know where you stand with Mrs Thatcher. I would like to see the situation in which you know where you stand with all politicians. And thirdly, a clear clash of ideas makes politicians honest. It makes politicians exciting. More of a crusade and less of a market exercise. Ideology might just be the rehabilitation of democracy. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to say something up. We're going to take questions for I don't know how long because I've obscured my watch. We've got um, 40 minutes or so for <coughs> till half past seven, so for, for questions or comments, <coughs> interventions, what have you like. Do you want to just. No, I'm, going to say, I'm going to say standing. Do you want me to take them? Or no, no I'll, I'll take them. Why is I have to begin by warning you that I wear hearing aids. Uh, and my doctor said to me when they were fitted, they're state of the art hearing aids, they're just as worn by President Clinton. They won't make you hear any better, but they'll make you irresistible to 18-year-old girls. <laughs> uh, so because of that, you have to speak very loudly. And it's a gentleman down there, I think. Yes, please. Yeah, well, that was absolutely fascinating. I, I wonder if you could comment on how you felt the trade union movement has either contributed or resisted this move away from ideology and party. Well, I think that uh, the trade union movement was part... When I say they're part of the past, I don't mean they can't be part of the present or future, but they're still stuck in the idea that you know which side you're on and we're it. Well, I'm not sure we do know which side we're on, I'm not sure they always are it. I do not take the view that everything the trade unions do are right. I mean, one of the great arguments during the winter of discontent, uh, I was going to say I ran the winter of discontent, I was running prices policy and incomes policy, and having constant meetings with my cabinet colleagues to say, no, no, they can't have 4%, they can have 2%, which is preposterous, but we did it. Um, and it was then came to me that the trade unions, which I naively thought were a universal instrument for good, can be quite the opposite in the wrong circumstances. Uh, when you see trade union shop tours outside hospitals deciding which patients can go in and which can't, it's difficult to argue the trade unions are a movement for good. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment the Labour Party has dissociated itself from the trade unions. Not just because of money, but because they're a solid working class base gives us some sort of stability. But we can't be in a situation where the trade unions tell us what to do. And that's got in a much more difficult position over the last five years. When I was in actively involved in these things, there were ten big unions, some of which were on our side, some of which were on the other side. Um, when I was standing for the leadership of the Labour Party, I knew the General Municipal Workers would vote for me. I knew the Transport General wouldn't vote for me. I knew the AU would vote for me. I knew the Electrician wouldn't vote for me. Now, there's only about four big unions to vote for anybody. And that means they have an extraordinary and disproportionate influence on party policy. <laughs> <coughs> and I think that could, be, <coughs> that could be changed. If the Labour Party were to lose the next election, which I don't think it will, but if it were, I think we'd have to take a very long look at the entire trade union relationship because we'd have to become again, oh, as I've said for 40 minutes, a party of ideas. A and a party of ideas is somehow blocked off by huge votes and huge sums of money which say, we know where we are already, we know which side you're on. I mean, I'm not prepared to be on the side, for instance, of all the things that happen on the London Underground. I'm certainly not prepared to be on the side of things that happen, still happen in London docks. We have to be in a position where we can say, this is right and this is wrong. And if you have to get to a situation where you can do that, sometimes you have to have the trade unions on the other side. Now, that may be that they come to a more reasonable relationship, but it's very difficult when the three big unions who dominate everything I get more frank as the evening goes on. I shall, <laughs> I shall break the official secrets out before I go home. Gentlemen down here. Well, thank you very much. Though. I really enjoyed it. I, I, I just wondered if you, if you cared to comment. There's a lot of speculation at the moment, isn't there, about the likelihood of, of no one party having an overall majority in the next election and the, and the kind of the need for yet another coalition. And I just wondered how you felt your emphasis on ideology and principled politics plays in that sort of scenario. Well, it's very much, it reduces the chances. Um, two things follow. I mean, first of all, what do we do in those circumstances? My old devoted friend John Coe 
And I became Shadow Chancellor in the worst possible circumstances during the Big Bang. I said to him, what do I do, John? He said, you do your best. Um, and if there had to be a coalition of three parties, we do our best. And I think that is probably the outcome. I think probably there will be enough two parties put together to make an overall majority. So the chances of the ideological commitment is reduced, though you try to put it as best you can in the coalition, much more strongly than the Liberals have done in the present coalition. I mean, the Liberals make big claims, but have achieved very little. But it, the prospect of coalition did change my mind on one other thing. I thought for ideological reasons that I didn't want proportional representation, because proportional representation automatically means a coalition. But now I think quite the opposite. We're going to have a coalition anyway. And PR will at least let people know before the election starts we could have a coalition. People will vote according to their views on what the coalition should be. Now people vote in the mythical belief that there might be an overall Tory majority, an overall Labour majority. I know Mr Clegg says the people voted for a coalition. Of course they didn't. 40% voted for Labour, 40% voted for the Tories, and 20% voted for other things. If there was a PR, we would know there was going to be a coalition before we started, and they'd take that into account when they're voting. But it does reduce the prospects of the sort of policies I want. But it doesn't reduce the right and duty to try and advocate them. You'll be arguing, that, you see, the, the truth of the matter is that every party in itself is a coalition. It's not, the, the Liberals and Tories together have some conflicts about what should happen in government. The Labour Party on its own had some conflicts about what was happening in government. I served in the cabinet with Tony Benn. Um, so you can imagine there were some disagreements about you know, whether, whether schools should publish maps of England upside down to show that the North was less important. Uh, you know, we have big conflicts. <laughs> um, uh, and oh, yes, it's true, it's true. <laughs> Whether we should solve the IMF crisis by increasing the price of coal, which <laughs> um, now so there's a lot of conflicts inside the government itself because all political parties in England are themselves coalitions. So the coalition just magnifies it, but it doesn't make the obligation any less. It makes the obligation the same, though more difficult to work out. What a, the gentleman right down there is going to have to shout. Would you say that the um, Profumo affair was the kind of the start of the disenfranchisement of politics? Well, I think the Profumo Affair was very important in some ways. Um, the Profumo Affair ended the era of deference. Um, until Mr Profumo was caught out, until Mr Profumo lied to the House of Commons, uh, newspapers wouldn't print the stories of indiscretions because they were differential towards politicians. And after the Profumo Affair, it had bro broken the dam uh, and every little indiscretion was discovered. Sometimes when there weren't indiscretions, they were invented. But politics were no longer treated as sacrosanct, who couldn't be assailed. I think that's a basically a good thing. Um, I think it probably happened anyway. A more educated population would have wanted satire, which was private eye, and that was the week that was. And we begin to take, take something out of politics, which I better not use the word. Um, and I think that's a good thing. But I think the Profumo Affair heralded the end of that rather comfortable Edwardian Macmillan era the uh, little local difficulty area where the politicians were different people who we didn't have to regard as having human frailties. But I don't think it changed very much in terms of the nature of politics. I think what changed the nature of politics is technology to a degree and politicians being able to win elections. I, I can't emphasise strongly enough what I said about Mr Gladstone not knowing how to win elections. If you look at the 19th century, um, every election that came along Nobody knew what it was going to be and very often turned out to be the other thing that people predicted. They tried to have elections when they could win, but they often were forced into elections when they couldn't win. But the ability to choose the election subjects and topics that make you able to, knowing what it is, knowing, uh, it's rather like the United States of America. I, I happen to know that Mr Obama, cross examined about the capital punishment, said nobody can be elected president of the United States who doesn't support capital punishment. Now he knows that from the opinion polls. In, and you can take example after example after example of that from Britain. Nobody can be elected to a, no Republican can be elected Prime Minister of Great Britain. Um, that's a very extreme example. But it's because we know how to get elected that politics will be corrupted by the possibility, the ability to decide on their own power. Gentleman with a laptop. Uh, hello. Uh, I have two uh, comments or questions. Please. The first one will be very short. Yeah. Uh, 
to do with academics, uh, Professor Ellis started off by saying that uh, there are people who don't think about politics all the time. And then you were saying that perhaps uh, the Tories see that they don't do ideology, they see their ideology as common sense. Now, uh, a political philosopher like, like uh, Paul, I think, would see uh, the term ideology perhaps in a different way from ordinary language. So it's not just between negative and positive uh, users of the term ideology, but the, I think that academics or philosophers use, use the term ideology in deeper sense. And I, I won't dwell on this too much, but as an illustration of, of that, I, I think Gramsci himself said something that uh, like uh, ideology manifests itself in what people consider as common sense. Yeah? Uh, now, on to a more, perhaps more practical, more immediate point, the coming uh, general elections. You, you're asking, uh, should politicians declare their positions right now, or wait till after they win the elections? I guess in a sense, uh, uh, you, 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 see it, you, you yourself see it as not being the right question to ask, because you're saying that we should uh, have manifestos. And, but the question is, how do ordinary people keep politicians to their manifestos? There is no mechanism uh, in between elections for us ordinary voters to keep politicians to their manifestos. I quite misunderstood what the Lib Dems meant by the right of recall, because I think that at the last elections, uh, some parties were talking about the right to recall your MP, uh, but nothing heard further about that so far. And I think that's important, this ability to hold politicians in a manifesto, because I think that in Western democracy, in fact in all democracy, there is an element of trickery. Uh, you, you, you put it in a different way, I guess, uh, because you talk about each party being a coalition of different interests. But I'm not so sure whether it's such a straight coalition because I think the Lib Dems, it, there's basically a contradiction between being a social liberal and a market liberal. So a party like the Lib Dems uh, are led by market liberals, but ordinary activists are social liberals. <coughs> so I, I know a lot of colleagues here, at least back then, who regretted voting for Lib Dems because they saw Lib Dems as being socially liberal, but it, at the end of the day, uh, we always knew that Nick Clegg was a lobbyist for the bankers, used to be a Tory himself. So there's this element of trickery. So I think the big question is, how can we actually hold politicians to account in, in between elections? And, and for me, here on campus, I, I teach at Leeds Beckett, I think it's very worrying because both at Leeds Uni and Leeds Beckett, uh, they're trying to depoliticize even the elections. For instance, uh, the Students' Union asked Leeds Beckett to help get voters, uh, students on the electoral register. But the university said that we can't do that, that's ultra vires. But the thing was that back in January, just two months ago, the Electoral Commission wrote to all the universities asking them to help uh, get students on the electro electoral register. I asked my students, how many of you on the electoral register? 10%, 15% of each class I teach on the electoral register. And the thing is, when I was a student at Warwick, you, you knew when there was an election going on because you have students campaigning for their, like, their, their own parties. But Leeds Uni actually prevents uh, student political clubs on campus, Leeds University, from, from campaigning. Okay, let's deal with two of those points. And let us skin to that onion, and I'll take two of them. Very important, and two points. <coughs> First of all, you said... Please, please <coughs> I've got some throat disease, which I may not convince anybody, but I will need to affect the front row. Um, <laughs> Political ideology and common sense. Well, you're inclined to think it's common sense if it's your ideology. As I said somewhere in the lecture, uh, if you had half a dozen Tory MPs here, they'd say without a shadow of doubt and really believing it, that clearly allowing the market to operate is the best way of producing efficiency and allocating resources. They'd say that's simple common sense. It does not seem like common sense to me, but they would say that and mean it. Uh, in the way I say it's common sense to hold the view of freedom, which is the ability to, not the freedom from, is again simple common sense. So there's a good deal of bias in these matters, which we'll have to expect. How you make parties seek their manifesto is a quite different and rather more complicated problem. First of all, believe me, I'm not here to tell you that politicians are all lily white. Nothing I said gives me that impression. But most politicians writing their manifestos do it in the belief that they're writing things in which they can and will do. I've written four manifestos. I am the only person in the world who has been on four Labour Party election campaign committees, all of which we lost. It's a remarkable 
<laughs> it's a remarkable record. <laughs> but the manifestos we wrote for those four elections, we believed we could do it. And most politicians struggle to do it because they wrote, wrote it there because they believe in doing it. The advantage of the manifesto, I might say in passing, is also one of the benefits it provides to the government. When the government is in power, take the example, 1951, Mr. Harold Macmillan becomes housing minister. And he's been at a party conference in which the proposal was 200,000 houses a year. And somebody from the floor shouts out, make it 300,000. And the chairman, Lord Woolton, said, OK, if you want 300,000, 300, it should be. So that went in the Tory manifesto. When Harold Macmillan got to the housing ministry, he said, our main task is to build 300,000 houses a year. And the province head said, but Secretary of State Minister, that's impossible. And Harold Macmillan said, it can't be impossible. It's in the manifesto. <laughs> and they did it. I mean, they did it. They were built rotten houses, I might say. Well, those of us who were in housing at the time, I was chairman of the housing ministry in Sheffield. They were called Macmillan <laughs> Hutchers. But they built, the, you know, sometimes the manifesto keeps the party honest. There's no way you can make retrospective judgments on whether they've done it or not. I mean, the example you gave of recall of member of the parliament, it's not to do with the manifesto, it's not to do with whether the government is performing, it's to do with whether the Secretary of State is running away with his secretary or whether he's embezzled the funds from the local Labour club. It's to do with his personal or her personal position. There's no way of doing it except de deleting, de defeating him in the next election. And believe me, that is a great incentive not to be defeated. I remember being on a programme called the... Uh, elder statesman and the, the, the election that Tony Blair was made Prime Minister. I remember it very well because the uh, Sun newspaper thought that it was a title which I wasn't entitled to. Um, and at the end of these programmes, Norman Tebbett, Roy Jenkins and I, chaired every morning by Robin Day, we went to have a drink in the BBC canteen. And Robin Day had a request, would we all write on a piece of paper what Tony Blair would be doing the day after he became Prime Minister. And Norman Tibbet was very technically minded. He said he'll be forming his government. Roy Jenkins was saying, worrying about the economy. And I wrote, planning to win the next general election. <laughs> and I've no doubt that's what he was doing, and that's what keeps governments honest. If you go to a, a party conference, decide things that can't be done, promise to the electorate and don't do them, you lose next time. As the Tibbles are going to find out over their ridiculous promise over student grants. If you promise the impossible, you'll lose the next time. And that's the only way you can keep politics honest. Have we got time? Yes, we've got time for another couple. Yeah. The gentleman here. Uh, Lord Hatsley, you spoke about greater equality and the link between the malfunctioning of society. You also said this quality should be provided until the people say, no more, we're happy with what we have. But don't you feel that there's a limit within the system itself for the quality? And if you look across the board at the major political parties' policies, that equality isn't achieved efficiently enough. Sorry, say that last sentence again. That uh, if you look across the board at the major political parties, for example, the Conservative economic policy and the Labour economic policy, that equality itself may not be achieved efficiently enough. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, but let me make clear, when I say it could go on until someone says we don't want any more, it's until the people who benefit from it say we don't want any more. Not until millionaires say we don't want any more, or the middle class say we don't want any more. It's the people who are supposed to benefit from equality say we don't want any more. That's the difference principle. Of course, it's, it's impossible to get complete equality, nor do I think I want it. Um, again, if you re re read R.H. Tawney, he says extending equality, and we'll I'll spend a minute describing what I mean by that, uh, is going to make people more different, not, not all the same. It's not uniformity. It's opportunities are more different than they were before. The sort of equality that I want is what Tony Crossan called uh, democratic equality, which is not trying to make you equal to me in size, shape, form, earnings, house. It's to make sure that you are not prevented from being the same with me by structural changes in society. It's what's called the difference principle. Not what's called the... I can't remember. It's what's called, anyway, it's what society makes people different rather than society themselves being different. So we want this degree of equality, and that can be achieved. But you're quite right in saying it hasn't been achieved up to now, and frankly, most of the time we haven't even attempted it. We can take one more, I think. Is that right? Can we take one more? I know, yeah. We and well, we'll, take, well, we'll, we'll, we'll go until one of us, either them or me, are exhausted. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go. <laughs> you, you say what? <laughs> I, think, I think I'm right in saying that you went to Hull University and... Neil Kinnock was at uh, Cardiff University, but the, I think all the people that stood to be the leader of the Labour Party at the last time had all gone to either Ox Oxford or Cambridge University. 
Is that regrettable that they've all come from quite a privileged background? And if it if it is regrettable, what could the Labour Party do about it um, to sort of have a, a broader range of, of people sort of get advancement in the well, party? I'm not sure the people who stood for leadership of the Labour Party from Oxford and Cambridge would say they come from privileged backgrounds. And what I'm sure about in 60 years ago, when I got a scholarship to hold, I thought that was a privilege. It was a different society, and we looked at these things differently then. Um, I th think the f f dominance of Oxford and Cambridge is very much being broken. Um, my last year with The Guardian, my last, my last day with The Guardian, as well as doing my new column, they asked me if I do a big piece on a public school, I went to Charterhouse. And uh, the experience was, I've never been to a public school before, the experience was remarkable. And as I left, the, de the boss of Charterhouse, who had been a dean of St. Of St. Paul's, said to me, um, well, some things we haven't talked about, we've not talked about worries. I don't want you to think everything is fine in this school. We have problems, and we have real problems. I said, well, tell me one. He said, two of my boys don't want to go to Oxford and Cambridge anymore. They want to go to provincial universities. They say there's good engineering here. Or um, now, I, I, this made my heart leap up, I must say, um, because I think that is gradually being broken down. And the fact that working class boys and girls, young men and young women are going to Oxford and Cambridge um, is a, a good thing. But I don't think any of us should think that that makes them in any way different people. I don't think we should feel inferior to them or feel they've had a better deal than we have. Uh, it depends what they do afterwards. It depends how much they seem to have acquired while they were there. I know some Oxford and Cambridge graduates uh, who you would probably kick out of your courses. Um, it's, d d don't worry about that. Just worry about what... I mean, the, I feel I've lived in vain because all I've said today is a suggestion that you shouldn't worry about what politicians are but what they do. Uh, it's a maxim which I'll should have included in my talk, but we'll now offer you. It's better to have bad men with good policies than good men with bad policies. It's better to have people who are apparently privileged who do the right things than people from the working class do the wrong things. It's the ideas that matter. And whether they come from Oxford or Cambridge or Hull or Beckett University Leeds, it doesn't really matter. It's the ideas that count. Anybody else? Gentleman here. Thank you, I voted for Ed Billy Band, and I agree with very much of the drift of what you were saying, Roy. I just want to raise one criticism that I think needs to be considered about the Labour Party in that respect and so much of its history has been vote for me and I will do this for you and I think that over the generations has disempowered people so politics is what other people over there do it's not what you and I'm hoping that if this if, if there is a new narrative it involves saying Labour people saying we must do this together They've got to end the disempowerment of people just because they're not elected politicians. And that's at a variety of different levels. And I wondered whether you shared that or you think I'm talking through my hat. That's not my fellow Americans. What America can do for you, ask what you can do for America, somebody said 50 years ago. Well, two things about that. First of all, I take your point. But I think it's very important not to let your point extend into the idea that we're all on our own and we make our own way and we either succeed or we fail. I mean, the, many of the things that I want to see in this society, and I know it's unfashionable, but I have to say it, can only be achieved by government intervention. We cannot end child poverty by government intervention. We can tell mothers and fathers that they need to do more to look after their children, they need to keep an eye on them, they need to be more prudent in their spending, they need to give them the right sort of food. We can't end child poverty without a lot of government action. I can give dozens of more examples of that sort without the government. And we mustn't get in a situation where we say, you're doing it. Now, the empowerment slogan has become very much associated with the least government is the best government. I mean, Mr. Smith, in a, in a criminal revision of Social Security, is said to be empowering people, making them work rather than live on Social Security. We can't let it get in that situation. I take your point, but somebody has to stand up for state intervention because the state is us or ought to be us. And the state ought to empower us. The state ought to be our agency doing things for us rather than some remote institution that does things for other people. Lady there. I thought you were just waving at me for a minute, but you were... <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned about uh, the Enoch Powell um, in your speech. And, and the syndrome of Enoch Powell, his, I mean, his racial legacies came back to the politics again. And commentators are saying that this election will be more more racial than ever. Do you agree? This is my first question. The second question is, you're talking about political ideology. What will the civil society ideology 
is there any difference between civil ideology of civil society and, and political issues? Is there any difference between civil, some notion of a civil ideology or an incivil society as compared to a political? Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's a difference. Um, I, 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 you know, the ideology should be all-embracing. It should be the view of the native of your society and all the other institutions which bring that about are together as one. As to the race question, I think we're less racially intolerant now than we were 50 years ago. I think we're always less racially intolerant than people made us out to be. I mean, I had the good fortune to represent a constituency which, when I arrived there, had something like 20% Irish, Northern Irish, Orangemen, Ulstermen, voting Conservative, and 10% from the Indian subcontinent. Nearly all of them from Kashmir, nearly all of them from Kashmir or Pakistan, Azad Kashmir, what we call free Kashmir. Um, and they're all from the same part. They're all these extraordinary people who had been given £150 to give up their land when they built the Magra Dam. The man came on the £150 to leave and built some sort of home, sent for his family, and they became part of the Birmingham community. And we were always told, you know, Powell told us, a lot of other people told us, that they, they would not only destroy society, but they would be rejected by their neighbours. They were rejected before they arrived, but when you live next to a Pakistani family, or a Kashmiri family, you enjoyed it. They discovered that you, they were human beings like you and it worked extremely well. And I think that's happened in Britain society. We're still, there's still racial overtones. Um, but fortunately, all politicians are beginning to fight those racial overtones. Nothing gave me more pleasure than the Tories have done over the last year than Theresa May, uh, who was not my favourite politician by a lot, taking firm action against Stop and Search on the basis that Stop and Search was almost always with people with uh, Asian or African origins. I mean, we were, uh, t five, ten, twenty years ago, when I was shadow, chance, shadow Home Secretary, I pressed Mr. Whitelaw on stop and search being racially biased, and he told it, said it was nonsense. The police, stop, the police stopped people they thought were likely to cause trouble. It so happened that people of uh, African origin were more likely to cause trouble than the others. Now, Theresa May is taking exactly the line I took. 20 years ago. Now this is all progress in the right direction. I think we are becoming a genuinely multiracial society. There's some more distance to go. And one of the distances, one of the new ex extra leaps of faith we have to make is people like me accepting there's still some way to go. Because I've lived all my life in a multiracial society. I mean, I represented 40, 40 50,000 people of Asian origin. Um, you take it for granted it's going to be all right. But you have to realise that it won't be all right unless you keep working at it. But I think people are working at it and it will get better. Yes, please. Yeah, um, I'm hoping you can help me because I'm, I'm, I find the current state of politics highly depressing. Um, I agree with you that it seems to me to be fairly empty of ideology. I think it's more about hide eology than anything else. Um, what do you think is... Um, can you give me some hope for the future? What do you think we're going to have to do to get person. ideology back I'm, on the agenda? I'm the worst person to ask for hope, because... <laughs> <laughs> Anybody in the audience, please. <laughs> I'm always hopeful. I am pathologically optimistic. Um, David Owen, I don't often quote David Owen, but David Owen once said, I don't know whether he made it up or whether it was actually true, that Gide said, Socialism is optimism and energy. Fascism is optimism, is pessimism and energy. And I think that's right. Socialism and is optimism and energy. A belief that can be in a better society. And what I think politics is in a terrible state. Society, by and large, is getting better. I mean, we've had a bit of a kink in the curve for the last five years. But things are now much better than they were for most people than they were 50 years ago. I mean, one of the problems is it's so much better for so many people that we've forgotten the people it isn't better for. The, the, there's still great problems of underprivilege, poverty, degradation, but they're now submerged in a way they weren't. When I was chairman of the Housing Committee in Sheffield, we had a waiting list of 130,000 people and the worst slums in the north of England. And we saw them and we knew about them and we demolished the slums and we ended the waiting list. There's now a waiting list in Sheffield of 100,000, but nobody takes any notice of it because it's different. It's people living in bed and breakfast. It's people, you know, I think it's better but it's a problem still to be resolved. But unless we believe we can resolve them, um, we won't. I always, when people say, can you bring about equality? I quote Matthew Arnold on the Holy Grail. He said, to find the Holy Grail, you have to search for it. And to search for it, you have to believe in it. And that's the same with equality. First of all, you have to believe in it, and then you have to search for it. And I think it can come about. 
But it may take a lot of, you, you may say it, I won't. But uh, it can happen as long as we have hope. And I don't think socialism and my sort of socialism can survive without hope. It has to be a hopeful condition. So it, don't ask me what's going wrong because I don't even notice it except when I'm thinking about it like today. <laughs> With which, uh, w w w one last gentleman down there. It's kind of building on a couple of points that have been made already, in particular around the idea. I mean, I feel that there is an ideology, and it's the ideology of the market, and it's the ideology of, um, you know, it's developed from the 1970s and it's been brought forward in sort of this, the current government, and if they get re elected, at the pinnacle of that small state, market driven. And to use your example about waiting lists for council housing, for example, or for social housing, is that. Back, back when the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, and probably later in the 80s when I was first getting interested in politics, it was felt that that was a problem and that the people were, you know, that it was the state's responsibility to do something for it now. And now the discourse in the media is around that it's the fault of the people on benefits that become demonised yeah. and the poor are, are no longer worthy. So there's, there's that part of it, but there's also a bigger issue, and I kind of feel that there's a political class that has been, has been brought up with and educated with a belief in liberal economic policy and a social construction that goes alongside that. And it's, and it's, it's hidebound the, the discourse in politics. So, you know, you know, Tories, yes, you know, that's where they come from. I kind of feel that Labour, through Blair, have been drawn into that and were bound by that, that discourse that the way out of it is more market, less state, building the economy. And, and, and that's kind of where I get, get a bit dismayed. I mean, first of all, on the Blair government, I don't, you've not heard me say a word in defence of Blair government, have you? It, 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 it did do some good things, but it, I didn't see the necessary to point them out today. Um, you're quite right, Blair government were the inheritors of Thatcherism. The great, politi great politicians, Mr. Gladstone, Mr. Joe Chamberlain, another one of my heroes, Joe Chamberlain said, great politicians are those who change the weather. And in the 20th century, two politicians changed the weather. One was Mr. Attlee who produced the social consensus, and the second was Mrs Thatcher, because what she stood for was inherited by Blair, and they were the things that you just described. The belief overall in the market. Uh, a man came to lunch with us the other day, because he's writing a book involving things I know about, who was an advisor to Blair, and accepted without a moment's hesitation that they believed in the market as the solution to all the problems, not only the problems of the, of the private enterprise, but of public enterprise as well, and the social system. Uh, these were inherited from Mrs. Thatcher by the force of her personality by Blair. But that doesn't mean we, the entire political class is like that. I don't think you should despair of the political class. I mean, if you had Ed Balls here um, and you asked him if he believed that the least government was the best government, he'd look at you if you'd gone crazy, because he doesn't believe that and couldn't possibly believe that. If you had any other shadow cabinet there and said, did we believe in the market any longer? Well, no, we've grown out of that. Uh, what you mustn't misunderstand is the fact that sometimes political parties go wrong and their party went wrong with the election of Tony Blair. I was very much a Blairite. I didn't realise that he didn't hold the views that I hold, that he wasn't a socialist. And one of the reasons I voted for the middle band, it seemed to me that we ought to have a leader of the Labour Party who was actually Labour, that we were moving in the right direction. Now, there were five, six years when things didn't go as well as they should have done. Five or six years when we should have built on what we could have done you know, in the first two Labour Party parliaments, first two parliaments of Blair's premiership, we could do almost anything. And we didn't take the opportunity to do the other things. But one day we will. As long as we have hope and continue to work for it, uh, we, as long as more people are saying it, the more likely it is to come about. And I'm sorry to sound like an evangelical priest or a result of preacher, but I am one. I mean, I'm an evangelist for socialism. And that's why I came here today, and that's why I'm very grateful for you to listen to me. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.